Winchester Model 71, a 1930s iteration to replace the 1886 and the 1895 with something that was a little more modern, a little more up to date. This particular example is one of the few that we have ever seen that didn't come to us in a bag. So here we go. This is a cosmetic restoration of a fairly nice Depression era gun. And what the heck, if you're going house hunting or elk hunting, we've got the gun for you. Down a rabbit hole, let's go. I was asked the question, where do you begin? What is the thought process behind how you tear a project like this down? I'm looking at, I swear the checkering almost looks like it was sanded off flat on this thing. It's been refinished once. Um, and when they did it, they sanded the checkering smooth. It's awfully small pattern. I'm gonna look that part up. The metal, the metal's just been worn smooth and to my knowledge, this is not one of those iron plated ones from the 1960s that you can't hot dip blue. You can rust blue anything if it's got iron in it. So we'll probably be uh, rust bluing. We do not know the exact mechanical status of this gun. Um, I, it was purchased by a gentleman that wanted to have one in the worst way and he begged me to look at it. So we're gonna go ahead and tear this thing apart and make sure that it's okay mechanically. So the first thing you look at on any gun is the bore. Um, that's the very first thing you look at. If the bore is no good, why do the rest of it? So we're probably gonna wind up, we'll just get the wood off of this thing, take it down and take a look on the inside. There isn't a speck of dirt on this thing. It's, it's, it's clean. So I'm not really even worried about dirt. It feels good. Um, and we just got to get that out of the way. So the very first thing is check the bore out and then here it's going to be six to one, half a dozen to another. Do we go after the wood? Do we go after the metal? The answer is yes, because if you look at an interlace of the time here, you do things to the wood and then you're waiting for oil to polymerize, oxidize. You're waiting. Um, my eyes can only take so much checkering in any one day. So we'll probably blast off on the wood first. While we're waiting on the wood, switch over to the metal, switch back to the wood, switch over to the metal, and it'll all just sort of congeal into something that looks like a Winchester 71. So let's go do that to the vise. This screw appears to have, goes through the cap and down into a divot in the barrel. When the, bar when the gun was uh, given to us, this was free to rotate, and that's what made me believe that. The only way we'll be able to get this cap off over this is to disassemble the front end of this thing first. So I'm going to go ahead and take that screw the rest of the way out. We'll just come up until, it's, until it slips. And then of course this thing wants to come across the room with a vengeance. Because it's going to want to drive that spring out at me. So we'll just control the release of that energy. And I'll tell you, somebody had gone through it because this thing is absolutely the least amount of dirt I've seen on a gun in a long time. What I don't know is, is if this tube is captured by that cross screw, and it may very well be. So let me get a little more appropriately sized screwdriver. Kind of massage the edges off of this screwdriver. That's perfect right there. One on this side, one over here, and that one's not in there very tight. If it's in there at all, it's maybe a cassette that pops through. Okay. What do we got here? All right. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've never taken this particular gun apart. So we're, you're on a voyage of discovery with me. Okay, this has a hanger and those screws are going into, I don't know if that's not screwed in or not. Is that coming back? Don't know yet. Anyway, nose cap comes off. 
there is a plug in here. There's an evidence that there's been some work done on this gun in the past. There is evidence there, there has been work done on this. I don't know if that's threading out or not. Threads. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't want to be stripping those. Okay. And then that means then that we can drive this tower out, or maybe we can just lift the forend off first. All right, see how pristine this thing is? We don't, whatever we do, we don't want to mess this bluing up. Dear God, look at this. And it's not a hot dip blue. This bluing is not on the surface, it's in the steel. So we need to, what we are going to attempt to do here is this. Winning in this evolution is to make this piece of this receiver look like this piece of this barrel. And nobody will know that we were in here. That's what winning constitutes. All right, we're going to flip this thing back around now and uh, take the back end off of it. Typically, these things go out to the right. Don't humor me, but see, there's a, a punch mark right there. So this has been tightened up a little bit. Polish hammer faces. It's got some corrosion on it, but it's been out of the hole more than once. Inletting is tight, no chips on the end grain. This is actually just, we're going to do a cosmetic refresh on this thing. It is absolutely spotless on the inside. So the last guy to go in this gun knew how to take it apart, knew how to put it back together again. I've taken a wooden dowel and I've turned the diameter down. This is the jack of all trades dowel that gets around in the shop. And I've turned the diameter just slightly under the diameter of the magazine tube. And you can see here where I have masking tape shimming this to a tight fit, but not so tight that it pries this open and snaps the bottom of the stock. So you gotta be very careful. It's kind of a fine line you're walking there. The finish on this is about halfway gone. It's, it's, it's gone. So we're just taking the remainder off. We're not moving a lot of wood. This is a scraper that we've sharpened. And all we're doing is just lightly taking off the finish. And we'll do that and we'll go all the way around. When the finish is off of this, and you'll be able to tell here, I don't know if we're in, in view or not. So. You can hear it just peeling it off, okay? We're not going very hard on this. We're just trying to take this whole finish off the top. I'm not entirely positive that the wood on this gun wasn't refinished once. The metal, I'm really sure it was never buffed. But the wood, I don't know. Um, but it's, this gun's been carried and operated a lot. So we have to get back down to where everything we're working with is consistent. So the way this scraper is sharpened, you take a, um, you take a, 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 what do you call this thing, a burnishing tool, and you take this burnishing tool, and with this clamp and device, you're running down this way and this way and you're putting kind of a gumby head on it. And it's like, it's, you can feel it, it's sharp here. In fact, I don't know if you can see this, but you can actually see the burr shining in the light. And when you sharpen that, it gives you a lot more control. And I know my hand's in front of this, but you can, you can see the remaining finish just coming off. Now, you try this on a browning, you're gonna need a hot air gun. But this is a straight up, I guess you'd call it a lacquer finish. 
where and I'm trying to not but there's no way to show you what we're doing here without getting up in front of you all right there is no way you can do this finish without damaging the check ring there's really no way this is um, a 150 no this is actually a piece of 220 because this wood isn't that messed up and all I'm doing to get a proper sanding job you have to get into the checkering and the checkering is damaged around the edges which makes me believe that someone else may have been here I don't know this is a stupid early gun and it's got the really fine checkering and I'm going to duplicate that but that's just 220 right there and that will do a pretty good job of taking this old stuff off what we don't want to do is remove a lot of wood from it now dense like this you can see this dark spot here we remove all the finish from around it and that leaves naked wood around there and we're going to steam that up My iron right now is at about 225, coming up to 400 degrees. And what we're going to do is make steam. And we're going to force water vapor into the surrounding wood fibers and pop this thing up and see if we can do it. To sand down to this divot, let me cross light it and I'll really show it to you. To sand down to this divot, what it requires to take a huge amount of wood away in order to be able to get there. And I really don't want to be able to do that. So we've gotten a rag here kind of wet. This towel here is a little bit wet. And I lay that right over the groove. And we drive the moisture down into it. And that took it about halfway up. Now you may not be able to get all of it, but boy, you'll be able to get a lot of it. I used to use a monocoat iron. I burned up my monocoat iron. And this one is for doing like stitching and gluing down lacing. There's a decorative end of it I don't know about, but this iron will go to 450. It's scary how hot this thing will get. It's about 1700 watts. And all those little hobby ones are only about two or 300. So we'll keep doing this. And what I found is, is it's better to wait until you get all the surrounding finish pulled up before you go after it because it just seems to work a lot better when you got naked wood around it. At the end of the day, the gun's only new twice or once, depending on your point of view. You may not be able to get all of this discoloration, the beading oil down on top of it. You're not going to be able to undo that. This gun was built in 1936, as far as we can tell. So, I mean, that's pushing 90 years now. 36, hell, that's the year my mom was born in. So, yeah, 88. That's, a, that's getting on a while back. Okay. One more time. We'll come after this one more time. We'll sand it a little bit more, and then we'll quit, because that's about all the world's going to give us. Now, as far as sanding wood, oh yeah, look at that. That popped that all the way up. That's damn near gone. That dent right there is damn near gone. Oh, it popped that up, and now I don't have to take a sixteenth of an inch of wood off in order to go after it. Okay. When you're sanding wood, I don't like going below 220, maybe into the 300s if you're really showing off. But the real trick is to get the D the tears and the cross greens and everything out and then polish the finish don't polish the wood if you take this to 600 grit it'll look great you won't be able to get anything to soak into it or absorb see that edge you don't want to round that edge off you want to make sure that when you scrape you scrape down and that you respect that edge you don't want to go too hard and you don't want to 
cut cross grain, but you want to make sure that this edge stays sharp. And where this really gets you in trouble is back on, say, a butt plate. So say, for instance, hand me that butt, please. If we were to sand this with this plate off, there would be a tendency to roll that edge and you'd be able to look down and you'd see that it was rolled off. In this case, the owner wants this pad left, wants the 1930s white line spacer to stay on it. Okay, so I'll sand all this straight off and it'll look like it grew there, but you just wanna watch that you're not rounding over See, like these edges right here will look like warmed over death if you roll them over. So you want to make sure that your edges have definition and that they stay sharp. Don't roll things over. So now we're back into this particular spot here. And all I'm trying to do is make sure that I don't go over the around the corner here. And this scraper is sharp enough. I can actually get away with going slightly across the grain. I've said before, this wood is like cat's fur. So you gotta make sure you're cutting it that way. If you try to come this way, you'll tear it. So I make some decisions because I'm running a shop that you don't have to make if you're doing a one-off gun. Okay. You're just doing one, you're doing great Uncle Lumpy Fratz's Model 71. First of all, condolences. Um, we had a, we had a lot of fun taking it apart and we chose to not show you it coming apart because we're going to show it to you going back together again because um, it's a uh, it's a three-step process okay coming back in now back your paper don't ever use your paper just freehand because you don't want to roll off that edge just saying so now we'll go all the way around and what I meant by damaging the edge of your check ring is you have to sand into the check ring pattern. You don't have to gratuitously sand the check ring pattern, but you have to sand over the edge of it or else you wind up with a border. You wind up with a roll and the pattern becomes submerged. The pattern will be lower than the wood around it. you get little pieces of it starting to, to um, fill up your sandpaper, it's because you still have some finish on the surface that you have to get through. We're trying to avoid that, and that's what we're trying to avoid with the scraper. This dent is right where Mr. Pabst or Mr. Budweiser would have set the front end of it down on a golf cart or something. Okay, where'd go? ourselves wet again here a lot of people will tell you don't get the wood that that wet it should just be moist yeah it doesn't matter don't leave it this wet have a way to get rid of the water as soon as you put it on and you get all the effects without any of the negatives by the way this is the color this is the color the wood would be if you just stained it natural, if you didn't hit it with a stain. Mr. Turnbull did one of these guns, and I'm going to go with his stain choice because um, that man's got a lot of run hours on him. I trust his judgment. see here and it doesn't dry out that's oil leaching out of the end grain right there so we're gonna let it leach and then we'll just wipe it off here with a rag right there now if you really want to go after that 
come at it with a very, very finely set plane or maybe even scrape it off. Um, now, if you do that and you scrape it off, you got to remember you put a little dip in it. So you got to go back and even this out and spread that little nick that you took. You got to spread that out over the entire gun. Okay, I don't want to do too much of that because I don't want to lift the lift lift the finish out of the pores, but you may have crossed that line here. So you can hear the wood tearing. You could hear it tearing. So we're gonna have to go in and we'll sand that off, and then that will all be smooth and uniform down the entire length. Of the gun, but since we steam that up, we get this nice, beautiful, uniform finish. A little bit more sanding. I might get wet one more time and show you that, and then we're going to go do something else. Do that and get it wet one more time bang and that's where that groove was and you cannot see it because it's not there anymore we got rid of that we made the forend just ever so slightly thinner we've spread that dip out we've taken that and spread that out down the long axis okay let's set up now and do a little bit of checkering all right, there's a rule in checkering. It says you never cut towards the master line. So uh, I'm just gonna draw a master line out here in the middle and I'm gonna tell you this piece of tape now describes the shortest distance across this pattern, across the three dimensional pattern, right? So we don't know where this line's gonna be when it gets back here. We don't know where that line's gonna be when it gets back there. So we're just going to lay this in and not take it for granted that the guy that had to checker two of these in one day knew what he was doing. So am I, okay, my, is my headgear in the way? Okay, because we have had our issues with checkering videos before. So I'm going to tell you, I got my tools set to cut this diamond pattern, but I'm going to make no attempt no attempt to replicate this pattern. There's no way. I don't, we don't have enough time and I'm gonna go blind trying to do it. So I'm just gonna designate, I've got the pitch of the diamonds right. I have the pitch right, okay? I have the center line of the diamonds pointing up and down. There we go. So now the center line, this is three and a half, these are threes. The center line of this is pointed up and down. You see right there? So I don't know what pitch they use, but I'm going to replicate it. It's a little bit less than three to one, like two and three quarters to one. It's fine. It's good enough. All right. I'm going to replicate it, though, because I don't want somebody to walk in after me and say that I screwed this up because I wasn't faithful to how the, um, how the pattern was cut. Now, ordinarily... I would be over here, but I can't get in front of this thing. So I'm just going to cut this down the tape like this. This isn't how I would work. Other thing is, most guys that, that checker, they ordinarily checker in and out. They would put their body here and they'd be running up and down. I put my body over to one side and come across. It's not how everybody does it, but it's how I do it. So that's what you guys get to see. Okay. Now the lines that we can cut, we can cut this one because this is a fill-in. This line here does not delineate the pattern, the, the corner. What we don't know is where this line is going to be when it gets over here. We don't know. But this is the original line that was originally cut on the gun. And when I'm done... You shouldn't really know that I've been here. We're just going to freshen this back up. 
And the line's got a dipsy doodle to it. Because the guy that did this just laid a pattern on this thing, scaped it in, and then went for it. All right. I've got this thing set for 24 uh, diamonds per inch, which is the original pattern. And I'm just going to um, set the new pattern with this. Get in there. There we go. And that's about as many of them as I can do at one time without cleaning up the ends of this, okay? So we'll clean this up. We know that this line is supposed to go straight and we're running over the top of a three-dimensional pattern. So there's a tendency to want to make this line dive off that way. And I don't want it to do that. Here, let's, let's highlight this a little bit. You have to cut all your lines in one direction first. And because the fence, you can't cut right up to the edge. This is not a magical tool. I know there are people that can cut two or three passes with one of these things, and I've never been able to do it. I use it because it has a fence and a carbide cutting wheel, so I don't want to get my finger up in there. We'll shut it off. That's a movable fence, so this rides in the previous line right here. You touch this thing while it's going, it'll pop you open like a grape. And I really don't want to get popped open like a grape. I'd like to continue my familiar relationship with the grapes in my life. Okay. You can only go four or five at a time. And I'm really not worried about a slight overrun here because I'm going to come back around and duplicate their border. See, and I'm corrected this line off, slightly off here, because they had started to bend on me. And now, and I'm having a hard time showing you this, but... That line now looks straight when viewed from here, but when viewed from over here, it looks crooked, you see? That's because it's rolling over the top of a three-dimensional object. So what I'm doing now is going backwards and I'm dividing any errors in spacing backwards. And then once I have them divided backwards, the human eye is awesome. It's splitting, splitting the difference. Okay, so now I've got the lines going all the way. Come back here, back that one in, back that one in. We've tried everything, and you don't want a camera right here. You don't want a camera here because as I move, you will get so seasick so fast. It's VR sickness. When when your eyes are telling you something, your ears are not telling you. And um, I'm... Got a little bit twisted around going that way. So I'm cutting these lines shorter. So I'm very slowly but surely making five lines fit in the space for six over here and six lines fit in the space for five. And what I'm doing is I'm rolling those lines back around again so I get where I want. Part of the game, um, this part of the game will run right down that one into there. And we'll run right down this one into here. And they're going all over the place because this is one tight ass piece of walnut. I'm going to tell you what. There we go. Now I got them.
There we go. You guys ever seen the meme? It isn't screwing up if nobody can tell you screwed up. Yeah, there we go. Family friendly channel, so I have to be careful about the actual words I'm using. I got right back to the original end there. Let me shut this off. I got right back to the original end. And I'm actually cutting in the direction I want to cut in. So you can see they're all come down here. And then this will come back and we'll go the other way. Now, why don't I just cut this way? Because you got to do all the lines in the same direction at once. You cannot succumb to the temptation cutting in, in both directions at the same time because then everything gets all chippy choppy it gets uneven depths and well it just looks like death and I don't want it to look that way so I'm not going to do that right see and there we go so now we're halfway spaced this way. We're going to flip over and go the other way. So we'll take this thing out of the vise. Flip it over. And we'll center it back up into your field of view here. You may want to check focus on that, brother. Yeah, very good. Okay. So now we were going that way. Now we're going to come this way. One of the things I'm going to do, give me a pencil, will you? Because I started in the middle of the, of the, um, I'm going to just do that. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to remind myself where my master lines were. Now, don't push too hard or you'll dent the walnut. All I did was just put a slight mark on that so I knew what line I'm using from my masters. Okay, so I lost, I lost my master line. So I'm gonna come back and cut this back in. I lost it because that was so deep. My initial cuts were so deep, they just cut right through that master line. But because I remembered where I put it, and I put that little pencil line there, that told me that it should be right about here, and there it is, it's popping right back out. So there's my master right there. And I'm glad I put that, I'm glad I went ahead and ticked that in. I knew where that was, right there and right there, you see. So that's kind of telling me where I was, right? Okay. And away we buzz. Okay. Let's see, let's roll this down so you guys can see this.
So in the back, back there, you can hear that fence right up over the top and this turned on me and this should be down here, right? And this long shoe on this 90 that I'm cutting with lets me straighten these lines out. There we go. See, now they're all straight. In fact, that one still has a little bit of a lilt in it. Checkering is one great big mistake. Um, the longest line you'll ever cut is that first master line because a pretty decent looking gun looks like crap the minute you do it. And what you got to be able to do, you've got to be able to just press through and know that the gun will look better when you cut the last one. Ah, oops, I made a mistake. Remember that mistake. Right there, see how that line ran off? Remember that. Because when you're done, your mistakes wind up on the floor as sawdust. Because what we're doing here we are not making diamonds. What we are doing is removing everything that isn't a diamond. This is sculpture. It's not art. It's a removal process. Um, here we go, right there. And that mistake is going to just disappear. And it will become just so much sawdust on the floor. See, there we go. And now, see those lines are now straight all the way to the back. Because I corrected that. And that little, that little roughness that went there just turned into sawdust. It's gone already. And we haven't even gone down below it. So, this goes on. You're typically... Pass number one, pass, well, actually, we'll do it this way. Pass number one, pass number two. So one's going this way. Two, three's going that way, and four's going that way. So you're attacking this thing from all the way around while you're doing it. These are not very deep diamonds um, because the lines are so small. These diamonds are maybe 16th of an inch. If it wasn't this gun, if it was just another gun or we were doing a checkering demo, what I have done before, I have come in and laid another pattern right over the top of an existing pattern, offsetting it slightly so you can see it, check her right down through it when I'm done, you can't see the original pattern because it's a removal process. And in fact, there's a pile of sawdust getting up on the floor. So this just continues on, ad infinitum, ad nauseum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bear in mind, the fact that I'm showing you this is going to open me up to some inevitable criticisms about my technique and how I'm doing what I'm doing and the fact that I'm doing it. And believe me, this is not Lawrence of Arabia's Model 71. Um, Back 1936, isn't he gone? Didn't he leave us by then? I think Lawrence was killed in a motorcycle accident around that time. So the chances of this 1936 manufactured piece of equipment being Lawrence of Arabia is probably pretty slim. Um, yeah, yeah. Information has just come to my attention that Sir Lawrence... Um, Actually, he wasn't a servant. Did he ever take the knighthood? I think he didn't. I don't think he didn't take the knighthood. 
Um, he was gone in 1935. The original man with the theme music from the wall. Okay. This is called maintenance. And I keep getting asked, you know, a question about patina, pay Tina. I gotta tell you what, somebody's gonna have to tell me when the hell a lack of maintenance turns into patina. I didn't take care of that there gun, therefore it's worth more now. Well, okay. So, as you can see as we're starting to close in on this, you'll note that this set of lines is getting a little bit closer to here than it is to here. And one of the things I like to do is take the gauge and just walk the gauge down it and put the gauge in this crack here and see which way it's pointing. So. I put that in there and it's pointing down ever so slightly. So this set of lines has walked a little bit and they're not going to make this. Now I've got two options here. I can either make this set of lines go back this way and just very subtly rotate them. Take a little bit more space here, a little bit less space there. Or I can say that this line has just been declared surplus. And wherever this line winds up, I'll just take that line and turn it into sawdust and leave it laying on the floor. Um, we can do a little bit of both. But if I start back here, oops. Eh, that's looking better. Now that I'm getting over here, I can see that this line is just about parallel so if we take the end of this line and kick it up ever so slightly we kick that up now we're parallel here and we kick it down down here by rotating the tool ever so slightly that way you can see there's a little bit of a, of a hump here right and then we take that division and we divide it backwards into where we came from we can now spread that ever such a slight line rotation out we can spread that rotation out over eight or ten lines and when we're all done you don't know we did it same When we get a couple of clean lines down range of this, I will be all right. Okay. There's a limit to how deep you can go or else you create these furrows. We're almost there though. There we go. We got that to come back around again. And those lines are absolutely parallel. So we've had to do that at both ends of this pattern. Because I'm telling you, man, this wood is hauling me around by the shirt tail. That's... Here's the other problem. You will hear guys that will be screaming their heads off about borderless checkering, this, that, and the other thing. And even though I'm being more than adequately compensated for this job, I'm not taking four days to do this pattern. I don't have four days to do it. I'm not sitting here taking super glue and sawdust and making sure that if the top of one of these diamonds got lopped off, that I put it back on again. Poppycock. Sooner or later, you got to get on about getting on about it. So here you go. We're down here now, and the checkering is starting to stand out. You can see a couple of places starting to make some corrections. Because any X, Y corrections we make are at the, at the behest of the Z axis. But your eyeball is pixelated X and Y. You've got rods and cones, right? 
Z is just a bunch of muscles moving to gelatinous mass and focus. So in and out, I can be off five or 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch. And you really can't tell when you light it like this. See, when you light it straight on, you can't see it. But when we light it and we cross light it is when you can really start to see that. And when I'm all done, I'll go through and feather all this out. And when I'm done and this gets oiled, mamma mia. So we're done here. This had a border around it. And of course, I'm going to get lit up for bordering things. And we're showing it in a light. Ordinarily, you'd see it in this light like this. And we'll get this thing stained here in a minute. But what I want to show you is where we came from. So this is what was on the gun. This is, well, pushing 90 years of, 88 years of wear. And I think the original checkering was kind of flat, but I'm seeing essences of points. There were two different kinds of checkering down on 71s that we can find. There's this 24 line print, and then there's an 18 that was done later and after World War II um, that was a lot more pointed. I pointed them up anyway, because that's what everybody expects. So the camera, <clears throat> the camera is a real, a real dogger here because the camera is going to show me, let me creep in on it, that line right there. You see how that line is deeper than the ones around it? I'll come back in and just tweak that line down and that line down and make that one line disappear. And that's kind of what I'm looking at. You look on the other side, this thing was hand checkered and they just took a, a pattern laid it down over this well you got a three axis pattern and even if this was made on a a cam follower duplicator there's no way that the, the distance from the center line of this stock to up here is the same as the distance from the center line to down here so no matter what you do there's some tweaking that has to be done in order to be able to make all the lines line up right across any three-dimensional object so <clears throat> what will happen here is i'm going to go ahead and blow this pattern in real quick while bruno eats lunch and then we're going to come back and oil this thing and talk about final sanding and oiling and see what it's going to look like at the end some of these winchesters were kind of reddish i like a reddish gun but in this particular case i don't know if i'm not looking at somebody else's refinish of a gun and then we're derivative so we've just spent a long time watching me do this and we're not going to spend a long time doing this i'm just going to do it bruno's going to eat we'll be right back all right this was the first side we did this is the second side we did now we've chased this all out and i've sanded this all down we've whiskered it a half a dozen times but we're only at 220. i don't like taking wood below 220 because you're supposed to polish the finish not the wood okay so we put a little bit of red stain in this and I think I've got this color. I think I got this Winchester color nailed. Okay, this is not a coat, this is an application and what we're trying to do is soak the wood. And we've done a little bit of recontouring on this forehand, just a little bit. So it's gonna be sucking the finish up for a long time. You put the Danish oil on and then it's volatile components. The Stoddard solvent will evaporate out of it. Um, Stoddard solvent is basically mineral spirits. Look it up. It's a fascinating read. And once all that's gone, then you're left with tongue oil and linseed oil. And it makes essentially a varnish. It's not shiny. It's not glitzy. And it sure as heck ain't quick. But you can get a beautiful finish out of a gun like this. And that's it. And this will go on and we'll let it sit here. And we're going to shut the camera off right now. We're going to turn it right back on in about 10 minutes. And we're going to go ahead and uh, wipe this off. And the oils will then oxidize and polymerize and get hard down inside the wood. And from here on, it's two coats. You go one coat, let it set, wipe it off. One coat, let it set steel wool it off, another coat, wipe, another coat, and 600 grit sand. And one of the beauties of sanding this stuff when you've got the oil is you don't leave any white marks. You can't cut through it. We're building finish in the wood here, not on the wood. When this thing is done, this will be absolutely 
spectacular and it'll look uh, it'll look correct. There were a few these two dark, these dark lines back here. You're not going to get down under those. I'd have to go in a quarter of an inch into this wood to get that. And I would rather just have a couple of cracks, live with it. The gun's eight, you know, 86 years old, 87 years old. We'll get it, we'll get around it. I always make sure that I come up inside the barrel channels. And actually when I'm off this container, I'll pull a swab with a bunch of it on it just to get the wood on the inside wet. Um, the only drawback to this red stain, this is an aniline boot stain. It's a boot dye. Um, and it's a very, very dark red mahogany stain. And you put a little bit of it in the Danish oil and a little bit of the uh, clear in a dark Danish. So what we wound up with was this container full of it. And then I've got a lid that goes over it. You can keep this oil open for a week or two if you exclude gratuitous atmospheric oxygen off of it. So right now we can take a quick look. We didn't shut the camera off, but you can see it's going to have a very rich, rich look to it. And I'm going to go ahead and get it wet again, but that's kind of where we're heading with the color on this. Um, very hard to get with all the different backgrounds. This camera is having an absolute not trying to figure out what it is it's supposed to uh, render. So it kind of had to shut the auto iris off. We'll go back in here. Now, subsequent coats, as this really starts to tighten up, you don't put subsequent coats on with a brush because you don't want to fill all of the checkering up. Subsequent coats will be dabbed on with the finger and rubbed in, and you can you just avoid getting it down in the checkering once you've got this open grain in here filled up. Okay? But there you go. There you have it. Now, off camera... I'm going to do the back end of this thing. And this is kind of where we were to where we are. And you can see all the, the, uh, the dents, the pops. You, see, you can see all the damage that had been done to this. Only about half of the original finish is still left on this thing. So we're just going to go ahead and take that off off camera. Um, the problem is, is that I can't keep Bruno over here 24-7 to film the entire duration of this project. I'd have to have a grown man not doing other things for seven days. And that's just not how this works. So I'll take you through that um, uh, with stills. And then it's gonna be time to do the metal, which is a totally different thing unto itself. But while we're doing the metal, this is setting up. There is probably two to three weeks before I'll actually have this wood far enough along that I'm willing to send it back to the customer. And then the customer can either continue to oil it uh, one coat every three or four days, or he can go ahead and wax it and it will look stunning. And on that note, I'm stepping off. Mm -hmm.